Hi, in this short video, which is our first video about the dot product, we're going to define the dot product and talk about some of its properties. All right, so far with vectors, we know how to add vectors. We know how to subtract vectors. We know how to multiply vectors by a scalar. So what we want to do now is learn a new operation. Now this is something that's completely different. It has some properties like arithmetic. It kind of looks like multiplication and we use a symbol that we also use for multiplication of scalars, but really it's not multiplication. We should just think of it as a new operation, something new and different that we can do with vectors that we can't do with numbers. It's called the dot product. It has a lot of names. Uh, it's also called the scalar product. And sometimes it's called an inner product. And here's the definition. If you have two vectors and their components are a1, a2, a3, and b1, b2, and b3, we write the dot product as a dot b, and we define it as a dot b is a1 times b1 plus a2 times b2 plus a3 times b3. So there are really two steps involved here in calculating the dot product. You're going to find the product of the corresponding components. So the first component gets multiplied by the first component in B, the first com second component in A gets multiplied by the second component in B, and so on. And then after we find those products, we sum them up. So let's look at some examples, just some numerical examples. I have a vector A with components negative 2, comma 1, comma 0, a vector B with components 1, 4 and 2. And then I have two vectors in the plane. Vector u has components negative 1, comma 1, and vector v has components 3, comma 2. So if I calculate a dot b, well, I'd have to take what? Negative 2 times 1, that gives me 2. 1 times 4 gives me 4. And then 0 times 2 gives me 0 add those up and I get two. If I do B dotted with A, well, no surprise here, I get the same answer because the operations that are involved are multiplication and the order of multiplication doesn't matter and addition and the addition of, of numbers doesn't matter. All right, what about U dot V? Well, sure, I take a negative 1 times 3, add that to 1 times 2, the answer is negative 1. So you can see that the dot product can be negative, it can also be positive, it can also be 0. And then what about A dotted with B? Well, that doesn't make any sense because A lives in space and V is in the plane. They have a different number of components, so that's not defined. In fact, operations on vectors from different spaces, a vector from R3 and a vector from R2, can't be defined, not even for uh, addition or subtraction. So let's look at some properties of the dot product. As we saw, uh, it's called the scalar product because even though you're working with vectors, your output is a scalar. Now, uh, a dot b, it's going to be a scalar, and it could be positive, or negative, or zero. And then take a look at this. This is very important. It's going to help us a lot. That if I take a vector and dot it with itself, and let's just use a vector in R3. So I have three components, a1, a2, a3. I dot it with itself, I get a1 squared plus a2 squared plus a3 squared. 
Now, that should remind us of something. We've seen something like that before. Oh yeah, the size or magnitude of a vector would be the square root of a1 squared plus a2 squared plus a3 squared. So we have a very strong connection between the length of a vector and the dot product. If we take a dot product and the dot product of a vector with itself, I get its length squared. Or you could think about the length of a vector as being the square root of the vector dotted with itself. And we're going to make use of these properties in this same video. We've got some more properties. Uh, we already saw that it doesn't matter in the order in which you take the dot product. That's because the underlying arithmetic is multiplication and addition. And the order of multiplication does not matter. The order of addition does not matter. We have a distributive property. If we're adding two vectors, b plus c, we could first add them and then take the dot product with a third vector, a. Or we could distribute the, the dot product across each vector. So I could take a dotted with b and then add that to a dotted with c. And if I have a scalar k, then if I multiply a vector times uh, k and then dot it with b, uh, well, that's the same as taking a and dotting it with the, the scalar times b, or I could just factor the scalar out in front. So we have this associativity here with the scalar multiplication and the dot product. Now, uh, as a consequence of our distributive property here, we can FOIL um, the uh, product of two vectors with the, uh, the sum of vectors with another sum of vectors. So I could just take the first, I get a dot c, the outside, I get a dot d, inside is b dot c, and then the last is b dot d. So our special products that we learned from uh, beginning algebra work in a way. I mean, um, the thing that we have to be careful about is that there's no squared, right? With dot products, there's no exponents at all. So when I do this special product, I don't, it would make any sense to write the vector a squared. That just is a meaningless idea, but, uh, I get instead a dot a plus two a dot b plus b dot b. And then the product of conjugates would just give me a dot a minus b dot b. And again, I really want to emphasize that even though it looks like multiplication, it's not. So in particular, there are no exponents for vectors. You put an exponent on a vector, that really demonstrates that you don't understand what a vector is. Uh, so we will uh, try to reinforce that throughout our future examples. All right, a lot of times we'd like to know the angle between vectors. It's extremely useful. So I have a couple of diagrams here and before we begin, uh, let's just take a look at this. Let's look at the diagram on the left. I have two vectors. I have this vector b and the vector a, and the angle between them is theta. I've completed this triangle, and this blue vector is, well, let's just think about it. To go from the tail to the head of that vector, I could go directly, or I could go in the opposite of b and then in the same direction as a. So the opposite of b would be minus b plus a. But uh, it's nicer to write that as a minus b. And 
in this case, in these diagrams, I'm using the bold face typeface to represent uh, vectors, and then I use this lighter italic uh, typeface to represent scalars. So now what I've done, these are just vectors. So now I'm going to take the same points here and connect them with line segments. And what I've done, of course, now this red line segment has the same length as the vector A. So the length of that line segment is the magnitude of A. The green line segment, its length is the magnitude of B. And the blue line segment, its magnitude is the, I mean, its length is the magnitude of A minus B. So remember, we're trying to find an expression for theta. To help us, I'm going to need this altitude, which I've dropped here, which I'm going to call its height, h. And that altitude hits the base, and it's going to break it up into two parts. So I'm going to call the left part x. Remember, the whole thing is the length of b. So then the right part would be the length of b minus x. Now, I try to avoid really lengthy calculations in my videos, just because I know it's difficult to pay attention. But I'm going to ask you to take a deep breath right here and work with me as we try to find this expression for theta. Sometimes it's just worth going through a process, even though it has many steps, but to just go through it carefully, step by step, make sure we understand each step, and then move on to the next. So we're going to start with a pretty easy idea. This altitude is going to break this triangle into two parts. Now, before I start talking about that, let me just uh, remind ourselves of important properties. What are we going to be needing? We're going to need the fact that if I take a dot a, it's the length of a squared. And I'm going to need these expressions from triangle trigs, that the opposite, the length of the opposite side is the length of the hypotenuse times sine theta. The length of the adjacent is the length of the hypotenuse times cosine theta. So in particular, in our left triangle here, the, the left, left of the altitude here, um, I can say that h is going to be opposite of theta. So, and the hypotenuse of this triangle has the magnitude of a for its length. So h would be length of a sine theta. x is adjacent to theta, so it'll be length of a times cosine theta. So now I'm going to look on the right triangle here, the right-hand side triangle with lengths h. The base is the length of b minus x, and its hypotenuse is the length of a minus b. And I'm going to apply the Pythagorean theorem. So I'll have h squared plus, now in parentheses, length of b minus x squared is going to equal the length of a minus b quantity squared. So that's just a squared plus b squared equals c squared from the Pythagorean theorem. All right, let's expand that a little bit. I'll go ahead and use FOIL, and this is just the regular algebra FOIL because these are all scalars. So I'll get the length of b squared minus 2 times the length of b times x plus x squared equals, well, what did we say? We said that the length of a vector squared is the same as taking that vector and dotting it with itself. So I'm going to take a minus b 
and dot it with itself. That's the same as the length of a minus b squared. All right, let's go on to the next page and we'll start with that equation there. And over here in the margin, I have a little reminder that h it can be written as the length of a times sine theta and x can be written as the length of a times cosine theta. We'll need that in a few steps. All right, so let's go ahead and expand our dot product on the right-hand side. We're going to use FOIL. Now remember, when we use FOIL, we don't get any squares. The first and last term is just a dot a, and we have to write that as a dot a, and b dot b, we have to write it as b dot b. And the middle term then is just going to be minus 2 a dot b. All right. Well, I see over on the left-hand side, I have the length of b squared. And then over on the right-hand side, I have b dotted with b. And a vector dotted with itself is the same as its length squared. So here's an opportunity for simplifying this expression. And I just want to remind us that we are trying to get to an expression for theta. And there's no theta in here yet, but we're going to try to clean this up first before we put in an expression with theta. And we'll get those expressions from what I put in the margin. All right, so I'm going to rewrite a dotted with a as the length of a squared. Remember, length of a is a scalar, so you can square a scalar. And b dotted with b is the length of b squared. All right, so now I have the length of b squared on each side. Let's go ahead and subtract that from each side and reduce the number of terms that we have. All right, so things are getting a little bit simpler. Still no theta, but it's coming. Now I have h squared plus x squared, which, by the way, I did move the x squared to be with the h squared. And the reason I did that is because now I'd like to go ahead and square both of these expressions. So then I would have h squared is the length of a squared times sine squared theta. And x squared is the length of a squared times cosine squared theta. Let's go ahead and make that substitution. Well, now I see that I have the length of a squared as a common factor in those two terms. I could factor that out. And why would I want to do that? Well, whenever I see sine squared theta and cosine squared theta, I'm hoping that some at some point I'll get to use this identity, that sine squared theta plus cosine squared theta equals 1. And so if I replace that with 1, I'll have a length of a squared on the left-hand side, a length of a squared on the right-hand side. And that will give me another opportunity to simplify. Let's subtract that length of a squared from each side. And then I'm ready for the theta. Let me replace x with length of a cosine theta. So I'm left with only one term on each side. On the left-hand side, I have negative 2 length of b times length of a times cosine theta. And on the right-hand side, I have negative 2 times a dotted with b. So if I just solve for cosine theta, I'll find that cosine theta is a dotted with b divided by the length of a times the length of b. So now, I mean, I could, uh, I could find the angle theta, uh, but actually this expression, leaving it in terms of cosine, uh, is very, very enlightening. Now, let's just remember a few things about the cosine uh, function. The cosine function is uh, when cosine e when the theta equals 0, cosine of 0 is 1. 
And then it's positive in the first quadrant. So from zero to 90, at 90 degrees or pi over two, it goes to zero. And then from pi over two to pi, it's negative. But between zero and pi, the cosine function is a one-to-one -one function. So we can have a, by taking the inverse cosine, we can find the value of theta from this formula. Now, we can actually then deduce a lot of information about angles and the dot product from this formula. Because notice that the other factor here, the length of A times the length of B, that's always going to be positive. So A dot B and cosine of theta are always going to have the same sign. So let's look at some cases here for the angle and the information we can derive from that. So if we have an angle of zero between the vectors, well then cosine of zero is one. And what does that tell us about A and B? Well, the angle between them is zero. They must be pointing in the same direction. And if I just put one in the place of cosine theta in this formula, that would tell me that the dot product is the same as the product of the lengths of the vectors. Now, this information goes both ways. So if I know, if all I know about two vectors is that their dot product is the same as their lengths, then I know that they must be pointing in the same direction and that the angle between them must be zero. Well, what if I have an angle in the first quadrant? So between zero and pi over two in radians or zero and 90 degrees in degrees. Well, that's what we call an acute angle. Well, that's the first quadrant, so cosine is positive. And we know that the picture that we should have in our mind is something like this, where if we put the tails together, they come together at this acute or sharp angle right there. And we'll know that the dot product is positive. So again, this works both ways. If I have a picture of the of the vectors, then I would know that the dot product between these two vectors is positive. If I know the dot product is positive, then I know that the angle between them must be an acute angle. All right, our next special case comes when theta is pi over two or 90 degrees. Their cosine is zero. And that tells me then that the dot product is zero, the dot product between A and B. In fact, let me add that to my, at least this row, this slide right here. I'd like to add the fact that A dotted with B must equal zero. And I use a word that maybe we haven't seen before, orthogonal. So orthogonal is another word for perpendicular. And so, of course, yes, if the angle between them is 90 degrees, they must be perpendicular to each other. But this is a great little test. If you want to know if two vectors are orthogonal, just find their dot product. If their dot product is zero, then they're orthogonal. If they are orthogonal, their dot product is zero. Now, what if we have an obtuse angle? The angle is bigger than 90, but not as big as 180. Or in radians, it's between pi over 2 and pi. So we're in the second quadrant, where we have an obtuse angle. In the second quadrant, the cosine is negative. And so our picture would be we'd have this obtuse angle between the vectors. And we know the dot product is negative. So again, we should have a picture in our mind, an idea about the dot product, 
an idea about the angle. So in, if we have this picture, we know that the dot product between these two vectors is negative and that the angle is obtuse. And it works all the way. If I have uh, an obtuse angle, then this picture should come to mind. And I should know the dot product will be negative. And finally, if I have an angle of pi, well, cosine of pi is negative 1. And so uh, A and B are going to point in opposite directions. They're still parallel to each other, but they're pointing in opposite directions. And uh, I know that the dot product is the opposite of the product of the lengths. Well, I hope you found this video useful. We've encountered some of the most important properties of the dot product, uh, and we're going to use them in a future video to work out some examples.